Musical prodigy Stevie Wonder was firing on all creative cylinders in the 70s with a stack of hits, even more Grammy Awards. Join us as we journey through Stevie Wonder's inner visions. Stay with us. Welcome, friends, to the 3324 podcast, home of the can koozie. Right here, if you're watching us on YouTube, yeah, we've got branded stuff. It's Well, this is actually a bottle koozie in this case. Uh, and I have all the labels concealed so you know we don't get in trouble uh you can figure out what's what may or may not be in this container okay uh, but it, for those listening it is in a brown uh, glass bottle so you go from there boy it could be anything soda, yeah, soda right. does not come in brown bottles no <laughs> we'll leave it there <laughs> right that, that's as far right. as it goes. um yeah if you're joining us for the first time welcome aboard uh, we're glad to have you for this episode Hopefully, you're going to have a good time. Plenty of other stuff that you could check out and new stuff always in the future. We're, 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 we're not only looking backwards, but we're a forward-looking podcast as well. We, we've got one foot firmly in the past with all the stuff we've done, Eric, right? Uh-huh. But there's always more stuff that's going to be coming. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm there's surprised. just plenty to talk about. That's yeah. Fine. <laughs> I'm surprised we haven't gotten to this gentleman earlier. I'm like, you know, I almost like smacked myself in the face and started punching myself like Bruce Campbell in Evil Dead. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell's the matter with you? Um, so yeah, we're glad, happy that we're getting that. Uh, go ahead and, and if on your favorite podcast provider, just go ahead and follow us if you're new to it. This way you'll get a notification each time that new episode drops. You don't have to worry about it. It'll be there, notified for you. And then when you're ready for it, you go ahead and listen to it. If you're watching us on YouTube, go ahead and hit the like and subscribe button. Same thing. You'll get a notification when uh, either the video version drops or the audio version. Both of those are on YouTube, uh, depending on if I upload the, the video, but the audio is definitely there as well. So you can check that out and have at it. So we're covering all the uh, all the bases. And then on social media, hit us up on Instagram and Facebook. We've got a great, vibrant community there, too. We respond to uh, comments, questions, and we, we love to interact and engage. That's all the technical stuff. Now we're going to talk about <laughs> music but first we need to introduce our guest mr christopher Clark. Clark. Hey. wow now you just couldn't right. wait to show off those well, I have the big box with the uh with the applause there you go <laughs> well now you have earned the audience upgrade Thank so you. now you get you get the applause you, you have been on enough episodes that you have reached the audience applause uh, well, tier. I, I feel very privileged to get the uh, audience applause tier. Yeah, so, um, but thanks. I got to be honest to you. I got to be honest before you say anything. If you're on an episode that jumps the shark, I've got the tomatoes button of throwing the tomatoes. And well, so, I would I would deserve that. <laughs> like, kind of like uh, the penguin in Batman Returns. Who brings tomato? Who brings tomatoes and lettuce to a a campaign speech? <laughs> I, think, I, I don't know. I think it's safe to say none of our guests have ever jumped a shark on this show. No, I mean, maybe we. No, have. I don't think so. But, uh, I think we popped the guppy, but we've never jumped the shark. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, Christopher no. Clark, thank you as always for uh, for joining in on us. We always appreciate it. And thank you as always for having me. I, I love coming on. So, yeah. yeah, and we love having you. It's always uh, a great time. Uh, and like I said, uh, Eric and I have known each other for forever and a day. So there's not too much that we uh, we almost have our the hive mind. If you're yeah. gonna go, uh, if you want to go to the Star Trek. Uh, <laughs> reference there but uh so having uh having christopher clark and our other great guests with us always adds that little l that random element mm -hmm. um good news is we've got uh three uh lies and a truth stevie wonder version uh nice. later on so we'll have that I've, I've worked very hard on uh coming up with it another person whose truths are just as amazing as any lies but i went with the three lies and the truth so you guys okay to figure that out now let's jump into it. let's get into this uh the the what we're here for we'll do our stats like we always do if you're new to the show here comes some just factual information before we get to the fun stuff this was released uh inner visions is the album released in august of 1973 produced by stevie wonder with some associate producers, uh, Robert Margaleff and Malcolm Cecil. I'm sure Stevie Wonder did all the heavy lifting as far as sound and, and all that kind of stuff. All songs written by Stevie Wonder. There were four singles released from this album. <clears throat> Higher Ground hit number four. Living for the City hit number eight. Uh, Don't You Worry About a Thing hit number 16. And He's Mr. Know-It-All actually didn't really chart here, but it was number 10 in, in, uh, in the UK. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, This album hit number four on Billboard. Uh, I was hard to find sales totals for this, but I think I've got it's seven hundred and fourteen thousand dollars, seven hundred and fourteen (laughs) thousand at the time. I think you have something different, Chris. Uh, What I noticed is I looked for that today too. Like I was just kind of like running the stats and doing some Uh googling. I don't know that it was ever certified gold, which I found really surprising. And like if you look, the first album that he ever recorded that um, actually had any kind of sales certification is Songs in the Key of Life, which I find really hard to believe because this record's yeah. a part of that golden period. You got like Talking Book, Music mm-hmm. of My Mind. It, it, like the fact that he doesn't really get a, a certification until 76 is really quite shocking, honestly. Yeah. yeah. Well, well there, there might be a little technicality in there too because they didn't actually start certifying stuff until like the mid to late 70s and then they had to go back and kind mm-hmm. of grandfather that stuff in, I believe. I, I believe there's a story with like with sticks or something like that where they were the first band to get a past certification. I could be wrong. I'll have to research that. that that's just somewhere in the in the dustbin of, of my mind. Right. Um, <laughs> but still, you would think that this album would have gotten something. What what I saw was seven hundred and fourteen thousand. So we'll go with it. If you've got other information, let us know. It did win two Grammys. It won mm. uh, for one for living uh, for the city for best R and B song, and it won album of the year. And Stevie Wonder's a 1989 Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductee. So he's uh, uh, definitely a, a national treasure. Just a little behind the scenes about um, Stevie Wonder. He was born six weeks premature. He was born with sight. But there, there were some issues because he was put in an incubator because he was born early. Uh, incubators are a very oxygen rich environment, which led to having the retina uh issue that he had which led to mm. his blindness so he actually was was born premature but then as a result of of caring for him uh he ended up going blind um so yeah and the, on this album uh there's nine songs he plays almost every instrument on seven of the nine pretty much he can't play guitar i I've, i think i've figured out like he can't he doesn't play guitar or can't play very well or doesn't want to because he plays everything else <laughs> yeah never you, you know if there's a guitar needed he, he grabs a guitar player but you know drums bass uh all obviously all the synthesizers all that great stuff so and um God. bass i think was like a synthesizer bass though like if i was yeah. reading the instruments correctly so it wasn't necessarily like a bass guitar a, a traditional yeah four string bass um <laughs> i want to i want to roll off some stuff for you guys i want to roll off some album titles um, because this what this did win uh, the Grammy for album of the year, right? So um, I'm going to roll off some album titles from 1973, and let's just just so I, I think also the listeners can kind of really see uh, you know how special of an artist Stevie Wonder is, mm-hmm. and what he was up against also at the time. I think that's important. Like oh, 73, maybe it was a light year for music, and you know whatever. Let me roll off some titles. Dark Side of the Moon, Pink Floyd. Houses of the Holy, yep. Led Zeppelin. Aladdin Sane, David Bowie. Goodbye Yellow Brick Road, Elton John. Quadrophenia from The Who. Band on the Run from Wings. Uh, selling England by the Pound from Genesis. Uh, Leonard Skinner's debut album. Goat's Head Soup by the Rolling Stones. Countdown to Ecstasy by Steely Dan. Uh, Billion Dollar Babies by Alice Cooper. Let's Get It On by Marvin Gaye. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Wild, The Innocent, The E Street Shuffle by Bruce Bo- Bruce Springsteen's uh, debut album and his second album came out the same year there. Uh, Living in the Material World by George Harrison. Mind Games by John Lennon. Brothers and Sisters by the Allman Brothers. I mean, yeah, Eric, pretty, what, I mean, pretty heavy year. <laughs> he's, he's swinging in, you and, know, like I said, this was not a light year, uh, a, a light all, year no. musically, right? No. Not at all. It's it's generally considered to be one of like the most uh, prolific years in the history of rock and roll, and if not Mm -hmm. pop music in general. Yeah, Yeah. I mean, Eric, that's all. I mean, though though you have uh, across the board from uh, progressive rock, some psychedelic, you know, the the stuff that Bowie was doing, and Mm -hmm. then just kind of classic rock like like McCartney, right? I mean, he's right. Seventy three was something. Yeah, I mean, you got three solo Beatle albums in that same year. Pink Floyd, arguably, still on the charts. You know, Dark Side of the Moon still, you know, uh, monster. I mean, yeah, monster year. 
we talked about several of these records. You yeah. Know? Uh, we have episodes for, you know, uh, yeah, Dark, Dark Side of the Moon of by Yellow Brick Road. Yeah. Um, so, um, but cool. yeah, I mean, amazing. And a lot of double. Notice that there was a lot of double albums in that list yeah. as well. That was the maybe, time of and, year. That was and the thing. Maybe that's, that could be perhaps the reason too. Maybe that's, you know, I don't know. But, uh, but no. yeah, this album so decidedly, I wouldn't say it. I, I would not call this a lightweight album by any means. No. And that in, you know, compared, yeah. you know, to the musically, I, I mm-hmm. think it's just as rich and, and deserving of the accolade that it got. I mean, it's, it's, it, it, it wasn't very good company though. Yeah. So, but, uh, but and, to and have, again, you know, yeah. Considering he's, he's pretty much doing everything by himself also. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So again, he's, yeah. a, he's a self-contained unit. Genius. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Genius is, is, you know, um, is it, that's an easy one to, to, to put on to him without any, any pushback. Right, Chris. I mean, it's kind yeah. of, he, he, you know, he was born in 1950 by the early sixties. He was a recording artist Yeah, I mean, know, on Motown and he was having hits, he, you know, he, so he's been in the business since he was a kid. And it's a couple things about that. Like the thing that always amazed me is like just his, his musicality and his ability. I don't know how as a blind man, you play the drums. Like I could see mm. the piano, but like, I guess if you know where everything is, but I just was always fascinated. Like not only that he played the drums, but he played them so well with a disability yeah. that doesn't allow yeah. to see where you're moving your hand. It just, it always blew me away, but um, he's an amazing songwriter. I mean, it's not even just his ability to play. It's his ability to write songs that like are just so powerful, like both lyrically and musically. And yeah. to your point about him doing it all on his own, I, um, this is a great book. I actually went back and I read the section about when he uh, did it. It's called, um, I'm holding it up. I don't know why it's coming upside. Oh no. Yeah. No, never a dull, it's reversed. <laughs> uh, never <laughs> a dull moment. Uh, it's about the year 1971. And uh-huh. that was the year he turned 21 mm-hmm. and he was able to like, he got a chunk of money from Motown. He had his contract renegotiated and they said, one of the things he really tried to do as he starts to enter that golden period with music of my mind and talking book and this one and, mm-hmm. and all those records is that he wanted to break away from being told by Barry Gordy, this is what you're going to record. This is who you're going to play with. And these are all the things that I expect you to do. And he really kind of bucked against that. And he ends up hooking up with the two guys that um, helped him produce this record. Uh, what were their names again, uh, Dean? Uh, Malcolm Cecil, who, who plays bass, who's the bass right. player, and Robert, uh, Robert Margoleff. Right, and they're responsible for this uh, synthesizer that he was using called the Tonto. Mm-hmm. Basically what it is, it took all of the different synthesizers of the day, the ARP, the Moog, uh, the Oberheim, and they patched it all together. If you can find a picture of it online, it, it looks like what um, the ENIAC, the first computer, looked like. It just takes up an entire room, and he sat at this keyboard, and basically these guys helped him program it. If he said, these are the sounds I want, he would they would put it together for him, and he used that to be able to record and play on his own because that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to be the master of his own destiny after being under the thumb of Barry Gordy for all those years when he was a kid. Yeah, so it's Eric, really a fa- I, fascinating. Before I kick it over to you, Eric, I want to go back and say that Stevie Wonder is a funky drummer. Oh, absolutely. Oh, right? oh. I mean, he's like, if you listen, listen to Superstition, his drum work on that and his drum work on this, I mean, he we really kind of... Um, knows what he wants and is able to accomplish it. Right, Eric? I mean, it, it's kind of, uh, you know. Yeah, I was surprised. I mean, I, I had no idea that he was such a, a talented drummer. Uh, I knew he did. I knew he played, but not like this. You know, you would think like these early these early records, they, they had jazz infused drummers come in and play, but it's it's him. That's amazing. He's he's up there with the with the best of them. Yeah. Think. And, and yep. just like, uh, you know, his contemporaries, Brian Wilson, same thing Un- under the thumb of like a recording contract or, you know, produce a, a, a label and wanting to break out and do, do your own thing. Right. And, and he, good thing about his career is he spent a lot of that, his younger years doing that toiling under, under the Motown label and putting out the stuff that was of the, I mean, it was very much of the sixties signed, sealed, delivered and, and all yeah. that stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, very, and, and popular. Um, but then, by, you know, you could say 10 years into his career, most people's career is over 10 years into his career. He's like 23, 20, you know, 21, 22, 23, ready to break out and tell, and tell Barry Gordy. Yeah. Listen, I don't want any, any restraints on anything I do. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and we had seen that two years previous with Marvin Gaye, right, Eric, with what's going on. Marvin That's Gaye right. kind of done the same thing. He was in that in the in, in the Motown Tamla factory yeah. uh, of, of that era, and then kind yeah. of wanted to you know uh, do stuff that was more socially conscious and just more hit closer to home. And interestingly, they both kind of were in that zone. Like 71 is when he turned 21. And that's where you start to see these string of records starts with music of my mind. And that's the same. Marvin Gaye went about it differently, but they both were looking to like not be on and to the point where I think Stevie Wonder tried to leave Motown at one point. He threatened to leave. And that mm-hmm. Barry, Barry Gordy saw it as disloyal. Yeah. yeah. So Eric, I think we see that we see those art, these artists just kind of kind of pay their dues to the label right and then they're kind of like well now it's my turn that's right and you know you gain a lot of knowledge you gain a lot of uh playing the with the best of the best i guess motown had their fair share Mm. of a wrecking crew if you will i mean talented musicians that have played on like all these r&b records of you know the time and uh learning from the masters uh and just getting out there and, and having something to say both lyrically musically um, and, and just really, you know, sophisticated music, you know, this isn't just, you know, some, you know, light fluff sort of pop stuff. We're talking about in, really integrated, you know, almost jazzy kind of, you know, really complicated stuff here, mm. I think, uh, on some of the stuff. I mean, there are songs that are just, you know, I would say free form and, and more, you know, there's like sort of jazz ballads, like, uh, on this record, uh, yeah. and, even like in the opening too, too high. I love visions. The second yeah, track, yeah. you know, oh, you, you think about Perfect. that song. It's a beautiful, beautiful song, and just the flow of it, and just but yet, but yet, it's not your what he would be do what he had done in the sixties. You know, the, the, yeah. he wrote like those sort of love pop songs then, but this was something a little bit a definite step up in in terms of its uh, sophistication. Yeah, more mature, right? And, yeah. and 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 in its arrangements also, right? Yeah. So mm-hmm. yeah, these are these you know, he's experimenting with new technology with the synthesizers, really embracing it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Talking Book, the album previous to this was really kind of the kind of the start of that. Um and then also like like you, Eric, you said, you know, there there are love songs, but they're they're coming from it's hard to think that he's only twenty three because they even seem a little bit more mature than that. You know, yeah. but he's been in the business so long, like that his growth, the the arc that he's on is so much more accelerated, right? He's so, yeah. you know, he, he's been in the business, so he knows how it works. He knows how, to, you know, knew how to use his leverage right, to, to f- construct a contract where he could be free. And then literally the, the name of the album, Inner Visions, like the, these are the things that are that are on his mind. And it's it's political, it's spiritual, it's... Yeah. Well, well uh, you know, know, romance. Like, there's, there's a lot of different things to chew on here. Consider the, uh, the the titles of all of these records, starting with "Music of My Mind," "Talking Book." This is him coming out. This is him. I'm. I got all this inside. Inner Visions is a, is a brilliant title for what's on yeah. this record. Uh, fulfilling this first finale, you know, that could be, you know, and then of course, songs in the key of life, which yeah, is right. his grand grand opus, but. Uh, uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, we're, you know, we're right from the get go. The, the title of the albums are so apropos and, and they just and they work and, and fit the music. You know, typically they're, you know, they're, they're al- album titles that don't make any kind of sense. Right. You know, <laughs> here that, you know, this is not the case. This is something that, you know, it reminds me of Coltrane and Coltrane in his most experimental, like in the 60s when he was, you know, uh, getting out there and getting spiritual and doing this wild stuff and just, and the song and the album titles of that time also reflected the, you know, the, the mood and, and, and the spirit of what he was doing. And it's the, it's the exact same thing here. So, yeah. Yeah. I think cause he's taking control. I think, yeah, in the sixties, it was like Stevie wonder swing, you know, swings or does what like, you know, kind of, or, or they would have a, you know, the album would be like one of the, one of the hits yeah, signed, sealed, yeah, delivered right. or whatever, you know? Yeah. And yeah, like, like I said, even down to like the title album title selection is very deliberate Yeah, and, and very much I'm in control of this and here's That's the right. messages yeah. I want to deliver and here's where I'm at. So, and, and with inner visions, um, yeah, it's got some pro- like, Maybe it's me, but but in seventy, this sounds ahead of its time for seventy three. Even with just the, the production is so nice and clean. Like it I is. really love how really smooth, nice like, this yeah. almost has an eighties smoothness to it that you didn't see that you wouldn't see until 
until later on in the decade where he mm-hmm. really kind of had this well arranged and, and like I said, like visions and too high that, you know, the way the album opens, it's very jazzy and yeah. very free flowing, but also jazzy in a way that it sounds, it's really pleasurable, like, like pleasing to the ear. I, I put it on I'm like, wow, this just kind of opens up and like feel I'm feeling relaxed. I'm kind of, I'm ready to take the, you know, take the journey. Yeah, this was uh, using the tools of the day, especially when you talk about synthesizers and how if they're used right and correctly, you know, th- he, he's doing it right here because it's it, it doesn't you know, there are songs where it really doesn't it doesn't sound artificial. Mm-hmm. It doesn't sound sort of, you know, mechanical. I mean, it's very organic sounding. Yeah. And it's amazing how he was able to cobble all of those together and get the right just that right tone. Yeah, Chris, you had. Uh, I was gonna say he it's and it's also that he's not relying solely on it. Like everybody kind of focuses. I think I called it Tomo right. before, but it's called the Tonto. Um, yeah. It's he's using the Tonto, but at this point he's knowing when to use it and he's picking spots. Like That's to right. me, some of the best, my favorite songs on the record are the ones where either it's not as prevalent that you hear it, or mm-hmm. it's not on there at all. Like it's like he's knowing to not overuse it. Just this is another you know, paint, you know, color on his, uh, pa- uh, paint palette. Like it's just something he's using, yeah. not the only thing he's relying on at this point. It's a tool. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah. And, and it's very impactful because the, like, like, you know, the first two songs like are almost kind of together, like two high envisions are very kind of similar. And then when living for the city starts, that, that that's like him picking his spot because you hear like this, doom, 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 doom. like it, it, it's a totally different tone. It's a totally different feel Mm-hmm. And and you're kind of ready for it, like he kind of he kind of lulls you into okay, this is kind of mellow. But then he springs "Living for the City," which is kind of like the centerpiece of the album, even though it's the third song because it's the longest song and it, and it's kind of uh, you know epic in its scope. The the radio version that you hear is very short. Um, yeah, and this has a whole other piece. It with does a, not you know, come close with, to the album. Yeah, with, with this kind no of way. interlude of a story. Um, mm-hmm. And then there's a whole other verse section at the end. And it's so, and this is where he's, you know, his inner visions kind of come to life where, where too high <laughs> is, about, is literally about drugs, you know, yeah. visions and, and living for the city is about what was going on racially at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, but he doesn't stay on one thing. He kind of then moves off of that, you know, to a romantic song and then higher ground, which is kind of about, you know, reincarnation and, and, and spirituality. So he really mm-hmm. kind of, moves through on this album he kind of moves through each one of these modes brilliantly yeah. especially with living in the city it's just like the way the the way visions ends and the way living for the city kind of per it starts it's like percolates like the way the song starts you know and, and then it kind of and then it picks up and you're totally in another you're in another world with that song. It's one of my favorite songs by him, just lyrically. And it's decidedly all optimistic too. He never you never hear a downbeat Stevie Wonder song. Yeah, you know, even when he's talking about these, you know, these these heavy social issues, mm-hmm. uh, but there, it's it's decidedly beautiful. You know, yeah. he's getting the message across, but you could do it in a way that is not, you know, you're not depressed. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it, yeah, he has, he has that knack of just making it and just taking something and making something positive out of it. And that's, yeah, there's definitely a yeah. sense of there's a sense of pride there, especially with living yeah. in the city. There's a particular lyric that I always key in on when when he's talking about the the character's sister Mm -hmm. and he says he her her clothes are old but never are they dirty so there's that pride that there's that 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 pride thing right it's like yeah we may have old and clothes but they're but they're going to be clean and and we're gonna we're gonna carry ourselves a certain way and that 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 lyric always kind of hits me and just the way he and just the way he's singing it too because he's singing very differently from the first two songs so you're getting that Mm -hmm. kind of superstition Stevie that Wonder, vocal. aggressive, yeah. Voice. yeah, but but, yeah. but but like you said, kind of pot like this is positive about about you know yeah, there's struggles and there's strife, but there's also a sense of dignity and positivity, yes, within it that mm-hmm. that you you know hold your head up even though the the end of the song gets you know the guy gets thrown in jail and he gets railroaded you know um it, it's 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 a little tough but it but it's also very realistic, Chris. Yeah, I mean to just to your point with that uh, line. Uh, I, I was chuckling when you said it because um, when I texted my old man and said I'm going on to do inner visions, he just replied with that line. That's how he replied. <laughs> so, like, and then, and then, t- then two minutes later, he's like, uh, uh, 
uh, that that's an amazing song. But you yeah. know, to, to to Eric's point about trying to stay positive or to like get your point across, but like still making it beautiful. Yeah. Like Miss Mr. Know It All like hit me partic- hit me particularly hard. I just cause I guess as a history teacher knowing what's going on in politics right now, mm-hmm. um, those <laughs> lyrics. But it, it but what I like about it is that it's supposed to be about Nixon, but it's not tied to Nixon. So it like still makes the record relevant now. And if yeah. regardless of what side you're on of the side of the aisle you're on politically, I think people feel that way about most politicians in general. Sure. Mm-hmm. And he's not putting it across in like uh you know, a fortunate son or American idiot kind of way where it's really super aggressive or, or angry. Right. He's just right. being very matter of fact. And it's, his, and, it, and it's this very beautiful song with this incredible baseline. Like it's, it's just, it's such a, a well crafted song and it's not the type of song you would hear tied to somebody trying to make a message about the state of politics in the country in 1973. So I, mm-hmm. I just thought that was really cool. Yeah. And he makes yeah. it universal, right? right. By, by yeah. not couching it one way or the other, uh, cause then on his, his next album, he had another song called you haven't done nothing, which was an, another swipe yeah. at, <laughs> at the administration, you know, kind of like, you know, so he, again, he's, he's not afraid to do it, but yeah, he makes it. So it's very listenable. It's not like, eh, you know, um, he just kind of the way he slides it in and, and even with higher ground, um, I, I, I'll be honest, Eric, I don't remember higher ground when I was young, like, to me, my introduction to Higher Ground was Red Hot Chili Peppers. Mine too. Like, and I should. And this this song hit number four, and and it was must have been on the radio. But I just don't remember that as much as yeah. like Red Hot Chili Peppers taking it and just making it their own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I I I was it was always one of my favorite songs by Stevie mm-hmm. Wonder, and I just never knew what album it was from at the time when I was younger. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, you're trying to look for this stuff and you think, oh, was it on songs? You want it to be on songs <laughs> in the key of life, being that's everybody talks about that record as being yeah. his 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 most, you know, popular. And, and you would think yeah. that all of those great songs came from that. <laughs> but that's not the case, because I think all of these albums are are, are great. Can, can I say with, Yeah. I was going to say, just to, to your point, I think songs in the key of life is a great record. But like, to me... This one is more powerful because I was I played yep. songs in the key of life yesterday, like throughout the entire day. Mm-hmm. It's it it's a great record, but it's it's almost too long. It's almost too much mm-hmm. to digest. What I think mm-hmm. is good about this record, it's a perfectly sequenced record as far as the songs, and it's only forty five minutes. And you get in, I, you get out. Like songs in the key of life, I was actually starting to get a little tired at, by the time I got to the end of it. Well, it's indulgent. it's a, it's new world record, right? It's the, it's, yep. it's that perfect length of uh, you know, it <laughs> says what it needs to say. Songs in the key of life have songs that are very very similar. Uh, uh, as, 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 you know, most of the double albums of the time would do, would, would just sort of be a little bit repetitive and a little, you know, um, but yeah, but still great stuff. I mean, all the way through yeah, that whole, uh, this whole period was just amazing. Just just to tie up the higher ground thing. Um, after the album came out, uh, Stevie wonder had a severe car accident. You know, the person he's yeah. driving with, they hit a, a car, a, like a logging truck, and the, the log went through, hit him in the head. He was in a coma for a few days. Um, af- you know, he lost his sense of smell and taste for a little bit, but he was very afraid that he was not going to be able to play again. He was very f- afraid that the, the accident took something away from him. Um, and, and it's interesting because higher ground talks about, you know, keep on trying to reach the higher ground about reincarnation. Mm-hmm. And, and he said, I didn't realize it at the time because, but it wasn't until after the accident that I really kind of really became much more spiritual and, and things that, you know, yeah. happen yeah. or don't happen for a reason. And, and, uh, eventually I, I think when he was in the hospital, his friend bought, brought a keyboard in and he kind of looked at it for a little bit. And then eventually he went to it and it, it was there. It, it didn't leave him, but it, but yeah. it kind of that accident kind of really kind of brought, brought more of that spirituality to the forefront. Yeah. And, and when he was in that coma, his friend to try and snap him out of it actually walked up to his ear and the doctor said, you know, say what you, you know, say, talk to him, sing to him. It can only help. It can't hurt. And his friend started screaming higher ground into his ear. And that's <laughs> when he, and that's when he started to respond. He actually responded to somebody singing higher ground to him. Yeah. Pretty wild. That's, yeah. That's an amazing story. And you know, I just wild. think I, I would I would argue that I mean, well, argue, but uh, 
No arguments here. It could it could it be that he just got even more creative as a as a result? You know, so you yeah. know you would you would think the the yeah, like he said, the big fear is that you're going to lose something there, something of your faculties, which you know he's already. Yeah, you know, he's already <laughs> struggling. I mean, he's already challenged there, and yet, yet he's, you know, and it's, you know, and, oh, and he's excel, he excels, but you yeah, know, yeah, absolutely. That's why I could, I could, under, I could probably yeah. uh, I understand the fear that mm-hmm. while you know I've had other things taken from me, now what you know, and, and right. I've been able to, uh, you know, to uh, excel at what I do despite that. Right. And, and not have it be a, a barrier and not ever. It's, I've never heard him complain or, or, you know, kind of any pity or something. No. He's always just been Stevie Wonder and he's always just kind of done, done what he's done. So I can understand after having an accident, like getting hit in the head with a log and he's kind of like, of the, yeah, I'm, you know, uh, as, what, as far as I know, one of the least controversial figures in music. Yeah. I mean, he's one of the most beautiful souls in music, I think. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I yeah, just, always just for, all for, around for, just great beautiful person peace and you know? love and and yeah and, and you know the brotherhood of, of men and women mm-hmm. um he's very much into that into the spiritual side you know very much like a like a uh a george harrison but without the affairs although he has <laughs> had affairs too, you, know, he's, you know but but kind of, but very much in the same vein right that that same kind of like search for spirituality and yeah. And and how it uh, translates into his music and and into what he's feeling, right? It was very much the same type of thing, um, but again, he was also making statements that, you know, uh, um, "Dark Side of the Moon" isn't going to make right. That you know those those mm-hmm. out al- you know that kind of an album is is very impactful, but in a different way, you know. And mm-hmm. and this is more along the lines of those personal statements. So it's almost the antithesis to taking a trip with dark side of the moon and inner visions is, is more taking an, an inner trip, but through someone's psyche and, and what they are feeling and how their uh, how, what their worldview is on things, you know, and you get that yeah. through each one. Um, I gotta say, I've, I gotta admit every time I listen to don't, don't you worry about a thing. It makes me want to watch silver linings playbook <laughs> because it's yeah. not like it's part like that dance. Like that's like the, 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 I think they play the most of that song in that whole dance medley that they do. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and it's so perfectly placed in that movie that when I hear it, I immediately go to that dance floor scene when they're, you know, uh, when they're all like waiting for the score, you know, why, mm-hmm. are, they, why are they so excited about a five? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's just one of those ones, but, but again, he, you know, this is Stevie wonder, you know, uh, fooling around with some Latin inspired stuff too. So we, again, he's not afraid to kind of go, but, but it all fits right, Chris. I mean, it's kind of, there's so many different things, but it is like kind of going through somebody's mind of, of the different things they think about. No, it, it's true. And, and like, like, I, I think what really makes it work and I, and I keep coming back to this is like, it's just to me, sequence does play a factor in how, and how, like, this is just a perfectly sequenced record and how the tracks play out. Like you said, like higher ground going into visions and just like, there's a flow that makes everything, not that it's one piece of music or a concept record, but everything just kind of melds together perfectly because of the way it's all laid out on, on the record mm-hmm. as a document. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they're, they're, the song, I, I think there's another lyric that I picked up on. I think it's in Jesus children of America. And it's, I, I might be misquoting it, but basically it's like, when, when you pray, do you mean it? You know, and it's kind of statement about religion. It's like everyone, you know, says how religious they are, but yeah, exactly, just, you know, when you're sitting down to pray, is it, are you, are you just doing it because everybody else is, or is, is it something that is, that's actually meaningful to you? So again, there's these, besides the great musicianship, there's a lot of lyrical content to, to kind of pour over and, and think about that. You give, you know, there's so much to chew on. Uh, in this album of balance. And I love, and, I love know, that Latin kind of, of thought process. You know, you mentioned the word pragmatic. I love the fact that somebody can throw something like that out there and not be preachy about it and not say, oh, you should be doing this or this or, you know, let's all whatever. And he's not really doing that. You know, he's, he's, you know, he's singing about love and he's singing about, but this is something that he's feeling. But it's not necessarily saying that you should do, you know, this or that. But, you know, make that point, say, look, you know, do you, you know, do you really mean it? Do you want to just, it's very matter of fact and it's very, you know, uh, it does make you think. And I think that's the, that's the, the, 
the brilliance of some, you know, some of these great songwriters that that have that knack to do that. They can make you think without, oh, I, you know, I'm not trying to impress anything on somebody because they'll, if you ask them, they'll probably tell you that. No, not no. That they're, they're trying to avoid those those kinds of discussions. I'm sure, but it's just, but you know, Dylan, I'm sure would probably been, you know, like people have been asking him for years, like, Oh, you know, what does that mean? What is that? What is that? He's like, I'm not trying to say anything. I'm just throwing the lyrics out there, yeah, you right. know, or John Lennon, um, same thing. It's like, I took yeah, a crap exactly. this morning and I wrote a song about it. It's not anything special. <laughs> right. You know, this is something a little bit different. Like a diary, of course. Though, right. This almost seems like a diary. Yeah. Right? yeah. Kind of That's a good point. Thought, you know, That's a good his, his thoughts of, of kind of just yep. on, on these different subjects. Right. And they're mm-hmm. like you said, they're not preachy because, if you write stuff in a diary or you, or you write stuff to yourself, you, you don't preach to yourself. You just write down thoughts. Right. Right. You just kind of write things down. You don't preach to yourself because you already know how you feel. Mm-hmm. So it's like you said, Eric, it's kind of more kind of a little matter of factly of, yeah, here, here's, here's some stuff to chew on. Here's some thoughts. You know, I'm just going to kind of put them out there and you do with, you do with them what you want. Yeah. I think the hope is, is that it reaches someone who will say, you know, I relate yeah, I you know I don't I don't I don't not necessarily agree disagree thing, but I yeah I could feel that I yeah. feel you you know like that that's you know and that's great and that's what I guess that's what any artist would want is to is to reach people and to get out there and and just touch them in in, a, in their own lives and so that's the yeah I guess that's but, the hope but yeah, yeah. I think mm-hmm. it's, I think the word that comes to mind after kind of talking all this out is this album is very thought provoking mm-hmm. yes right and and you wouldn't think it. Because of again, how stuff is ba- some it's ballady, it's jazzy, but like I said, w- within there, the statements that he's making is it, yeah, like like it, you said it perfect, Eric. It's it's not preachy, but it's he's giving you stuff to think about and say, yeah. well, here here's just a thought I had, you know, when yeah. you pray, are you are you do you really mean it? I'm not mm-hmm. telling you that you're bad if you do or you don't, but here's right. what I thought about it. Here's here's a thought I had because when I caught that lyric today or yesterday, I'm like, holy shit. <laughs> you know, like, it's like, kind of like, you know, it, it just kind of hit me. I'm like, it wasn't I, like I was driving when I was listening to it. And I really wasn't ready to like, I wasn't looking at the lyrics. So when it came, I just kind of heard it, mm-hmm. you know? So, so I think what, you know, what this album does and, and also the way, you know, what's going on also, right. Again, a very personal album, yeah. um, maybe a little bit more preachy or maybe just a little bit more socially conscious of the times, mm-hmm. but very much the same thing. Here's what's going on. Here's what, here's what's happening in my world, here's my worldview. Have at it, you know, listen or don't. Um, I don't necessarily think it's uh, more um, socially conscious. I just think the folk, I think Marvin Gaye's focus was only that, whereas this is socially conscious, but also being very reflective on other subjects, which Mm -hmm. I think might even make it more relatable than there's somebody feeling like this guy's just talking about politics the whole way through. And when I, you know, and there's, a, you know, when you th- think about things that struck you, Dean, when you're talking about that lyric, the other thing I was, when I was in my classroom this morning, getting ready to teach, I just, I don't have Spotify on my school computer. So I was listening to it on YouTube and somebody had a comment under visions and like the comment was relating to the fact that he's talking about visions and seeing things in his mind and the idea that mm-hmm. that's coming from somebody who doesn't have sight. Yeah. Like even just that yeah. in and of itself is something like you're like, whoa, shit, I didn't even really think about that. He mentions that, he mentions that a lot. He talks about the sky being blue. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, he talks about the, uh, uh, the uh, I think it's in Visions, uh, about the autumn yep. leaves, that they're brown yep. or they're, yep. they're, the leaves are green. But then when autumn comes, they turn brown. And, and yeah, yep. it's very like, you know, not to belabor it, but you, you would not know that this is a person that is is challenged by not having vision or not having sight, but can – perfectly uh illustrate lyrically things that that we take for granted right and then Absolutely. you're thinking like wow this guy can't see but he's but he's talking about these he's talking about the blue skies and and colors actually in in too high he's talking about reds and greens and and she's tangerine and all these um other things that that are very insightful again for you know that we may take for granted but then if you see where he's coming from it's like yeah that's even even more like higher marks for him well, kind of like Brian Wilson, him being a little bit deaf, yeah, and yet you know, he he creates these perfect harmonies. How does that? How does that work? You know, like he hears it in his head. It's it's in there. You know, you you know the language. You know, it's it's there's there. Uh, yeah, it's it's amazing. 
you know, just amazing just how the human mind could work in that, in that fashion. So, yeah. yeah. And, and then there's a, there's a little bit of wordplay too. I noticed there, there's two, um, the opening, the opening track on side one is too high. The opening track on side two is higher ground. <laughs> yeah. Also, both songs use the word high, but they're used in different terms. The first one is about drugs, right? About literally about a, a woman who's getting too high and she overdoses. And then mm. the second one reference to high is spirituality. And again, so he's using he's using words um, and making points, but also a little wordplay in there as well. Kind of, you know, uh, get, getting you to think about these things a little bit deeper. And that when I looked at that, I'm like, oh, wow. OK, that's just mind blown 2.0, <laughs> you yeah. know, on this album, like another, <laughs> just another thing that he's doing uh, that that's just kind of I don't know if he's sliding it in or um, or if I'm reading too much into it, but it's for me, it's kind of all, it's all right there. It's kind of, yeah. just, this is just an amazing set of songs. It's like, like Chris said, sequenced greatly and performed like to perfection. I mean, it's not any, I don't think there's any nitpicks. No, Nothing. no. What is it about this period in the, you know, the seventies? What, what is it about this, this time that just is so inspired? Even now it's so inspiring. You know, I think I, what I don't it was, know. I, I think we might have talked about it, Eric. I, I yeah. when we did our we did an episode greatest decade for music. Yeah. Oh, seventies for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's what I said. Um, I think what it is is this. You know, the the you know rock and roll came to at what we know in the late fifties, right? And then it mm-hmm. kind of went dormant for a little while until the arrival of the Beatles. So I think the '60s was that growing period of, of again, we saw all that innovate, that weird innovation. We saw all these different groups m- mimicking the Beatles and then other offshoots. And by the time you got through that and you got through the hippie and the psychedelic, it was kind of like here, well, okay, here's all everything we've learned. Yeah. Now let's put it to use. Like like the '60s were like the growing pains of rock and roll. It was subversive. It was this. It was that. And then all of a sudden it became like, okay, it's not going anywhere. It's here to stay. It's an art form. You know, and, and by that time, you know, you had the splits, you had, you know, what, what would Led Zeppelin do and what all the Southern rock, you had Allman Brothers, you had all these genres springing up at seemingly at the same time, because everybody felt free enough to be like, well, here's my spin on what I was hearing in the sixties. But since I'm from the South, it's going to have a little bit more of a country feel to it because that's what I'm bringing to it. Right. And yeah. Zeppelin brought something else to what they were doing. You know, so I think it, it, to your question is, is yeah, this was like a, a very, a, a time of like immense creativity. Right. Well, I think because you hit it on the head when you said, when you went, when you say the word free, that's what I, that's what comes to mind for me is freedom. Uh, Cause like you said, I mean, you know, we weren't really, I mean, there was charting, of course, you know, their hit singles, but, but people weren't really making albums necessarily to be hits. They're just doing what they wanted to do. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, unfortunate, but it's just not really the case anymore. No, no. I mean, you know, very different. Yeah. And yeah. the other thing is band, bands had room to be experimental and find themselves too. Cause like yeah. back then, you know, like I, the one I think about is yes, like yes, put out three records and they didn't hit until the third record, which was the yes album. And there's a mm-hmm. lot of bands in the seventies that are like that. Those first two records didn't really, weren't really hits out of the gate, but they had like three or four records to find their audience so they were allowed to be experimental and play around. Queen's another example of that. They don't hit yeah. really until sheer heart look, attack. Look, look at Genesis from 1973, selling England by the pound. They didn't have any, like nowadays a label would not stay with this, with, with Genesis. No, no way. Going through all, like as they figure things out and, and kind of work it out. It's like nowadays is, is labels want all this stuff worked out. We don't have time for you to fiddle around for five albums mm-hmm. before you, get somewhere with it. Right. So, so to Eric's point, there was that freedom slash tolerance from the labels. Like they would sign almost anybody and you would get like a yeah. five album deal and, you know, you can kind of do what you want and, you know, you, you'd either get dropped or you'd kind of get that lightning in a bottle, kind of like Steve Miller did. Right. When we did Book of Dreams, I'd like to think Steve, Miller, Steve Miller, it took a long time too. He, he really yeah, didn't hit tell the Joker. Right. That was a good five years into his career. That's what I'm saying. He was kind of plodding along. Then all of a sudden he started like hitting, he started understanding what his formula was and then was able to replicate it and go further. But I think that the people in charge of all this, like the, the, the producers, the, you know, they, a lot of them were into music Right. They're, they weren't just businessmen. They were they were music. A lot of them were musicians themselves. 
producers, arrangers, you know, that kind of thing. So they had a, they wanted these people to do more. They wanted to, you know, go for it. Just, you know, do what you, you know, they recognize talent, but they, they thought that they, th I, I think they thought that you could do better. You know, you you could actually improve on on your talent and do something different. And I want to hear that. You know, yeah. um, and it was a more just, artistic time. It was it yeah, was more it was right. Seen less as a commodity and more as an art form. Yeah, you yeah. know, like I said, like Zeppelin had no hits. You know, yeah, they were they were getting kind of popular on the radio, but same thing, right? They, no discernible hits. Pink all Floyd, albums. no discernible hits. Right, mm -hmm. it's just all out. They, they, Pink Floyd didn't really have a hit until the Wall. Let's be honest, like a, a, a certified right. like hit, right? Yeah, yeah that's know, right. Everything else was was kind of popular, you know, album stuff. But even not everything from them. So it's mm -hmm. you know, yeah, it was just a different time of of labels, you know, l letting these artists kind of figure out what what they're doing. And um, yeah, now it's more about you know, I mean, it was obviously about dollars and cents back then, but now it's even more like okay. We need something right away, you know, that we can market. We're not, we're not going to waste time on it. So you need to, you need to have an audience quick. You need to, they need to love you and, you know, right out the gate. Otherwise you're, you're done. You know, that, that's the sad truth of it. Um, it's unfortunate. Yeah. But, and the whole business yeah. is, you know, people are self-producing though, which is a lot yeah. more freedom in a different way than artists had back then. Back then you mm. couldn't self-produce or promote. Now you can do this stuff in, in your living room or in, right. in a side room. And, and, you know, if it catches on somewhere, you, you know, you can, you can kind of make your own luck. So, so things are different and, and some, some, in some ways they're better. Uh, but back then, as far as, as far as a, a business goes, it was a lot more freer from mm -hmm. a, from a corporate standpoint. They were, yeah, they'd give you a five album. They look at, again, look at sticks. Another one, they're just plodding along, plop, plopping out these prog albums you know, until they hit with lady and then they would, you know, they wouldn't hit again until much later. So, mm -hmm. um, but, th but this, you know, Stevie wonder was just out of the gate from, from when he started, yeah. he was just like, you know, th yeah. he, he, this is a problem that Stevie wonder didn't have. <laughs> like, oh. like he did have a, a, a little bit of a lull when, when his, uh, as he got into his late teens, his voice started to change and Motown didn't know what to do with him. And they were kind of thinking about dropping him. They're like, well, he's, you know, it's kind of like that Peter Brady thing, you know? Yeah, it's, um, he wasn't you know, like, little what? Stevie Wonder anymore. Yeah, with that. Like, yeah, like yeah, that, yeah. That, that transition period. They're like, well, I yeah. think we, we've, I think he's kind of run his course. And I, I forgot who it was, but someone convinced Barry Gore, like, don't, like, don't give up on, on, on this kid. Yeah. Like, you know, there's, there's too much there. And, and thank goodness it didn't. But I mean, and listen to his vocals. Like, you know, we, you talk about his musicianship and all that other stuff and the writing. Vocally, like, that was the thing, like, towards like because i just kept listening to this record over and over again this weekend mm -hmm. so that was one of the things that really stood out to me is just like vocally he people don't talk enough about what an amazing vocalist he is and his and the way he delivers these things and he he has all these tools as a singer but he doesn't like over sing either which some people tend to do sometimes it's just so perfect and so crisp and just so beautiful to his voice yeah. It's, yeah. it's one of the things that i think sometimes gets lost when you talk about stevie wonder as a musician yeah, and, and on this album, he shows you that he does, you know, with with living for the city, it's more of an impassioned vocal. With don't you worry about a thing, it's more, it's a little more jazzy. But then he could do all the the ballady stuff. Yeah, you're absolutely right that his vocals are just that we've spent a lot of time, you know, you know, kind of really celebrating what a great musician is. But yeah, vocally as well, he 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 can match all of that, so he brings the whole package. Um, mm. All right, I I think this is a good time to do three lies and the truth. <laughs> What do you think? <laughs> I'm down. You got no choice. We're doing it anyway. So Chris is like, no uh -oh. what your <laughs> so if it's the first time <laughs> listening, this is a, a, a relatively like, new segment. Although Chris, like collective ready. sigh was like, <sighs> <sighs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm ready. I'm, I'm ready to go for this one. All right. <laughs> so if, if you're new to, to the show, mm. this is a relatively new segment. We're going to read four. I'm going to read off four statements. Three of them are lies. One of them is true. These gentlemen, their task is to uh, sort through the bullshit mm. and uh, and find that one nugget of truth that's in here. So I'm going to read the four statements. Um, we're going to have Eric go first. And, uh, and uh, playing at home, let us know how you do as well. So here we go. Here come the four statements. Statement number one. Along with Stevie Wonder, Paul Simon, Taylor Swift, and Frank Sinatra... They are the only artists to have won three 
consecutive album of the year Grammys. I'll read that one again. It's a long sentence. Along with Stevie Wonder, Paul Simon, Taylor Swift, and Frank Sinatra are the only artists to have won three consecutive album of the year Grammys. Statement number two, Stevie Wonder released an instrumental album in 1968 under the name Ivitz Red Now with no vocals. Uh, statement number three, Stevie Wonder was the second youngest solo artist behind Justin Bieber to top the charts. I have number one. Uh, final statement. In 1991, Stevie Wonder won an Academy Award for his soundtrack work on Jungle Fever. Okay. Mm. I'll go through them one more time. Along with Stevie Wonder, Paul Simon, Taylor Swift, and Frank Sinatra are the only artists to have won three consecutive Album of the Year Grammys. Number two, Stevie Wonder released an instrumental album in 1968 under the name Ivitz Red Now, which is Stevie Wonder backwards. Number three, Stevie Wonder was the second youngest solo artist behind Justin Bieber to have a number one hit. Final statement in 1991, Stevie Wonder won an Academy Award for his soundtrack work on the film Uncle Fever by Spike wow. Lee. Three of those are false. One of those is a nugget of truth in there. Oh my God, this is tough. This is really hard. <laughs> These all we sound plausible. Yeah. This notes for you. <laughs> um, I'm kind of, kind of beating myself up here because I usually, when people do soundtracks, I'm mm -hmm. unusually up on that, but I, okay. I don't know if that statement is true. Okay. Uh, These are Eric's inner visions that we're getting. Yeah. Um, oh, man. I don't know. I. You know what? I think I'm going to go with just I, – I really don't know. I, okay. I just, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of stumped. Sure. But just for shits and giggles, I'm just going to go for number two. Number two, because it's just an odd an instrumental album in 1968 yeah. under the name Ivet's Red Now, which is Stevie Wonder spelled backwards. <laughs> You're thinking know. that's true. I'm thinking that's true. I don't know. Already. I don't know. Uh, Chris, do you need them red again or you got it? Uh, I got it. I got it narrowed down to the last two, Jungle Fever and uh, and the Justin Bieber one. But um, okay. I, I think I'm going to say uh, – shit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm going to go with uh, the one about Justin Bieber, about him being okay, second. So he was, Stevie Wonder was the second youngest solo artist behind Justin Bieber to, top, to have a number one, uh, number one hit single. Yep. Is what you're saying. And then Eric said Stevie released an instrumental album in 1968 under the name Ivitz Red Now, which is Stevie Wonder spelled backwards. Okay. <laughs> the first lie. Uh, Stevie Wonder did win a, an Academy Award, but he won it for The Woman in Red, not for his soundtrack work on Jungle Fever. He won it for uh, I Just Called to Say I Love You. Won an Academy okay. Award for that. Okay. So he did win one. Uh, the next lie, um, along with Stevie Wonder, Paul Simon, Taylor Swift, and Frank Sinatra are the only artists to have won three consecutive Album of the Year Grammys. That's false. Stevie Wonder is the only artist to ever win three consecutive album of the year Grammys. Hmm, That's really? an incredible statistic on its own. This, this inner visions was the first one. It started here and then went and it ended with um, songs in the key of life. So uh, pretty amazing. Again, this mm -hmm. in, in the seventies it's, it's, and before this was talking book, you know, like, yeah. Go, go figure. Okay. So we've got two, we've got two statements left. Stevie released an instrumental album in 1968 under the name Ivitz Red Now. And uh, Stevie Wonder was the second youngest solo artist behind Justin Bieber to top the charts in 1963. He topped it with uh, fingertips was his number one. He was, uh, uh, what do we want? The truth or the lie? You decide. No, your call. <laughs> yeah. My call. <clears throat> Let's go with the lie first. Uh, Stevie Wonder was not the second youngest solo artist to release a, t a number one song. He was the youngest solo yeah. artist at 13. I no one had figure out how old Justin Bieber was. That was the, the no one has had a number one single younger than him. Eric, it's true. He released an instrumental album in 1968 under the name Ivitz Red Now. Stevie Wonder <sighs> backwards. Wow. And it's wow. just all instrumentals. It's just jazz instrumental stuff that he did. 
That's a total guess, but uh, wow. Well, you know what? Yeah. I was, I, you know what? I, I was, when you <laughs> said you, when, when you said you didn't know and you were going to guess, I fucking knew that that's the one you were going to pick. I knew you were going to pick that one for some reason. I'm like, this SLB well, is, is going to pick the, he's going to, he's going to get it. Well, you kind of said in the beginning it. when you said that, you know, um, uh, the the truth is just as amazing as the lies. So that kind of, that that was a little bit of a tell right there too. So for okay. me, uh, right. I might have been thinking of that subconsciously when I <laughs> I don't know. But so yeah, yeah just, those, those are, are some I amazing. Put it, I'm really not surprised by it. I mean, of no, course, not at but all. Just, yeah, but uh, but yeah, yeah, he was only 18. Um, <laughs> yeah. So uh, at home, how did you do? Let us know on social media. Hit us up on Instagram, Facebook, or and or YouTube. Uh, and thanks for playing. Eric, Eric's got a, I think he's pretty close to 50%. He's kind of, he, he gets them, <laughs> then he'll miss a couple, then he'll get a bunch in a row. Chris, I, I don't have your stats. Have you been keeping score? Uh, I think I'm, I've slightly more wrong than I have right. <laughs> okay. All right. That's what I like to hear. <laughs> that means I'm doing my job good. Uh, do we need to do favorite tracks on this or what? I mean, this is just kind of, uh, it would, it would, is it a fool's, fool's errand to even talk about favorite tracks on this or what, Chris? Um, I mean, like, I know there's like the obvious ones, like living for the city and higher ground. Like, I think, you know, everybody knows those, even if you've never heard the record. Mm -hmm. Um, I think visions is an amazing song. Um, I love all, all in love is fair and mm -hmm. Mr. Know it all. Like to me, what I found surprising listening to this record I'm usually the guy that's like listening to like, you know, the louder, the faster, the heavier, like, you know, mm -hmm. the more bombastic. That's usually like my wheelhouse. This record I was list I was struck more by the ballads. I was struck more by like yeah. the softer side of the record. So that's why I'm saying like Visions, uh, All in Love is Fair and Mr. Know It All outside of the obvious singles. Those are the, the four, the three or four that I really think are the most powerful. Yeah, very, mm -hmm. very reflective songs as well, right? The yep. the 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 slower ones, Eric. What, you know, what do you got? I like the first three tracks. Yeah. Probably my favorite. You know, the way this album starts. I mean, every song is good, but I, I think for me, those are the strongest. Uh, yeah, I love, I love, like, like, like Chris. I love Visions. I think that's an amazing. It's a beautiful, beautiful song. And that yeah. acoustic bass line, um, it's just so oh, man. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I have to go with "Living for the City." It just—it's just such a, a powerful song. Outside of that, "Golden Lady," I really like it. It kind of a lot That's of the nice songs too. on the first yeah. side kind of roll into it. They kind of almost roll into each other too. They almost kind of—you don't yep. get a lot of gap in between. So it kind of right. it gives you that kind of the way thoughts flow, where you go from one thing to another. Um, and G Jesus, Children of America, I kind of mm -hmm. like it. It's kind of a you know. Again, it's kind of a, you know, you get, you're getting kind of two spiritual songs in a row, which is kind of interesting that you didn't spread it out. Um, but like I said, the lyrical content on that, just for, I found that just very compelling. So um, did you have Golden something? Lady, Golden Lady reminds me of um, what's going on. A little bit. It has, it has that vibe, yeah. like the bass line and the, and the rhythm and the cadence just mm -hmm. struck me to be like that song. Yeah. Uh, Golden Lady, lead vocal, piano, Fender Rhodes, drums, it, now you say Moog, Eric. Do we say Moog? I think it. I, 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 used, to, I used to think it was Moog, but I, I, I'm pretty sure it's pronounced Moog. I, I, I had a choir teacher in high school who was a prog rock musician who actually met the guy who made the keyboard, and he made sure that we all pronounced it Moog. Doesn't mean ah, right. okay. Doesn't mean he was right. <laughs> we met the guy. <laughs> Uh, the, the Moog bass uh, and the Tonto synthesizer. So yeah, again, uh, Stevie Wonder is like a is which is which is what Eric and I love. We love self-contained artists mm -hmm. that do like that do everything that can do everything that you know. Th this way, they don't have to fight. You know that yeah. usually when you were the band, you you know you got to I want it. You know, if you can play everything, why not? Then they you do it, and you don't have to compromise your vision, and you know for better or for worse, that that cuts both ways. That statement, um, yeah. You know, if you don't have somebody there, you could be too indulgent. But if you know what you want, like a la this album, a la Pet Sounds, you know, when you've got a a, a vision and you know what it is, mm -hmm. and you just need to e execute it, you know that that's what this album is, you know. And he's able to do everything, you know, with pretty much, you know. 
uh, on his own. Um, you get something as beautiful as this as well, too. That, that's the thing. It's just the, 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 the sound of this album um, is just is just something different than yeah. all than the other albums that that I mentioned from seventy three. This just stands apart, and maybe that's what maybe that's what why it won, and maybe that's why he would win two subsequent album of the year awards mm-hmm. too, um, because he was just kind of hitting something that was like you said it was it, it was of its time and timely, and and you know the the lyrics were were timely, but like like Eric said, not preachy, but but delivering it to you. It delivered and it yeah. flowed. It just yeah. flowed. It, it, it just it came out. And the hooks, you know, he's got, you and know, it, yeah, he's got the hooks also, you know, because, yeah. uh, <clears> you know, <throat> after this was fill it, fulfilling this his first finale. Mm-hmm. And that's got, you know, a boogie on Reggie Woman and you haven't done nothing. Um, you know, he was just, this was like his zone from yeah. like 73 to 76. I think they call um, it his golden period. Yeah. Yep. Well, they, they, yeah, it was kind of like his, they call like the sixties, like his teen period. Then this was like his, his golden era. And then the eighties, what they call his pop era where he was just writing mm-hmm. pop songs. Like I just called to say, I love you. And yeah, but but McCartney wrote that, but still, you know, it, it's weird to think that the guy who wrote that did this. Like, I, I don't know. Maybe I just, I don't know. And he was only in his forties. He was still young in the eighties. Like the guy is eternally youthful because he's yeah. been in the business since he was a kid. So you usually think, oh, you know, uh, people that were around in the sixties, they got to be old now. Well, he was a child when he was doing it. So he again, he was ahead mm. of the curve yep. and, and was able to hit his stride at the right time as he grew into maturity and grew into his own person, and then was perfectly placed in, in the seventies to just kind of put out these statements that were mm-hmm. timely and people were ready for. So it's just an amazing thing. Go ahead and check this out. It's on, it's on all the streaming services. So, uh, you know, this was a, a, a gushing episode and, and uh, justifiably so. Yeah. It, I mean, really great. Uh, sure. It's a great album. So Perfect I, I was born, there was, I, when I was looking, I'm like, God, wh- which one? <laughs> you know, it, 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 it probably wasn't going to be songs in the key of life. Cause it was a double album, which can, yeah. can get a little long in the tooth, but um there talking was so book many, is amazing too. Yeah, talking book talking is like, another oh. one. I'm like I, I used to listen to that when I was a kid in the library. Yeah, uh, I remember it because and it had the braille on the inside. It had braille on the inside of the of the. It was a uh, a gatefold jacket, and it had braille on the inside. And I remember I would listen to. to I never listened to Superstition. I didn't even know about the song. Yeah. I used to listen to "You Are the Sunshine of My Life" over and over. That was the only. I just used to put that on in in the library. Just listen to that song over and over because I just loved it. You know, and, and oddly enough, just a side thing before we go, my one of the first cassettes I ever got, not, not that I bought with my own money, but my parents, was a Stevie Wonder cassette. Uh, hmm. It was like his greatest hits from like the 60s. It had like fingertips on it. It had all this other stuff. It was, it was pink. It was a pink cassette tape. Yeah. And you got okay. it like, like Masters or Caldors or one of those defunct department <laughs> stores, like one of those compilation wow. tapes, or, you know, those compilation tapes that, you know. Good Lord, has a blast from the past. Caldor. You know, yeah, those, yeah. those compilation tapes that they used to have like in their yep. bin. Right. Uh, it yeah. was like one of those Stevie Wonder compilations. It was one of the first tapes I had. So yeah. I think I'll figure it. Go, I, go, uh, I go way back with Stevie. So anyway. Uh, let us know what you thought about uh, Inner Visions, uh, hit or miss. I, if you're saying it's a miss, this might not be the podcast for you. Anyway, wow. uh, go, play your, <laughs> go play your Moog synthesizer. And I'll play my Moog. There you go. <laughs> so, Christopher Clark, thank you so much for joining us. As thanks for as having me, as always. Yeah, thanks, for, thanks for gushing. We're not the only two gushers here people yeah. like you know we got some really great people on this thing so we love hearing your thoughts oh, yeah we love having you on your so expressions on. and yeah so it's yep. always great it's always great having you and of course we'll have you on for for more episodes and as always eric will be on that comfy couch and i'll be on this hard green ikea chair so for chris for eric this has been dean and we will see you on the flip side <laughs>